Now we'll see there again in my key verse there in the, the fourth chapter of first Peter and the seventh verse that Peter, he again, he warned that the end of all things he said is at hand. Now let's understand today that this was, and it still is today it is a very urgent warning to all people. It is a warning that nobody should be ignoring today. Peter, he again said, the end of all things is at hand. What does he mean there about the end? What does he mean there by all things? And again, it being at hand. What does Peter mean here today? Well, over in the first chapter of Colossians and the 16th verse, Paul, he wrote that by the Lord, all things were created, which are in heaven and on earth. And for further clarity in that scripture, Paul, he said that God, he created all that's visible and invisible. Paul, he included the creation of thrones and dominions, principalities and powers, that which is of the spiritual domain. So when we speak of all things, when we see Peter speak about all things, all things we should understand literally is talking about anything that you can imagine in your mind. And then even more than that. Because again, God's thoughts, they are higher than our thoughts. His way, they, his ways, they are higher than our ways as well. So again, let's make a note here about Peter's warning. Peter's warning, I want to note here today, it's not one that he made up on his own accord. Jesus, when he began his ministry here on earth, he announced that the time is fulfilled and that the kingdom of God, Jesus said, is at hand. Christ's first coming, it started the clock. It started the clock ticking towards the end. So every moment after his first coming, I want you to understand today, it has brought the world a step closer and closer to the end. Every passing second is a second closer to the end. So again, we need to understand today, well, what is the end? Well, over in the 24th chapter of Matthew's gospel, I hope that you'll turn with me over there to, to the book of Matthew in that 24th chapter. You'll see in the second verse there that at the end of his ministering years, Jesus, he warned his disciples that not one stone would be left that would not be thrown down talking about the end. Again, look at that verse closely. Jesus said to the disciples, not one stone would be left that would not be thrown down. As shown over in the book of the revelation of Christ, the end, it will come with the first heaven and the first earth passing away. Then a new heaven and a new earth will come forth again, talking about the end. Now, when Jesus, when he, when he gave this warning to the disciples, the disciples, they looked at Jesus with, with questioning eyes and, and they said to Jesus, Hey, well, give us the signs. They wanted to know what the signs of the end, what they would be. They wanted to be able to be on the lookout, if you will, for the end of time. And so again, as we take a look there at that 24th chapter of Matthew's gospel, we'll see that Jesus, he explained to them that there would come great tribulation there in the 21st verse. 
Jesus said that there will be great tribulation, which has never been seen ever in the world. And then Jesus, he explained to them in the 29th and the 30th verse there, he said, immediately after the days of great tribulation, he said that the sign of the son of man, that is he himself, that is talking about Christ. He said that the sign of the son of man will appear in heaven and he will come on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Talking about his second coming there. And then if you turn to the 25th chapter, just turn one more chapter over and you take a look at the 35th verse there, Jesus, he said that at his second coming, he said that all nations will gather before him again, talking about the end. And Jesus, he said that all nations will be separated as a shepherd divides his sheep from goats. So what I want you to understand today what we must, what we should understand today is that the end will come with God's judgment, his final judgment. That is the end. Now I want to point out to you as well, the end, it will first come with Jesus taking his sheep out of this world. The end, it will first come with Jesus judging his sheep. This is what led Peter to write there in the fourth chapter and the 17th verse of first Peter. This is what led him to write. The time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. The second of my key verses there. And so again, there is a note here of urgency in Peter's words here. What we've seen in both of my key verses in the seventh and the 17th verse there. This is a warning that we should make a note of here that all people should be preparing themselves for the end, which again is God's judgment. Mm -hmm. Believers first, we should be getting ourselves prepared. We should be getting ourselves ready to stand before the Lord. Are you ready today? This judgment is something that Paul, that he wrote of over in the third chapter of first Corinthians in the 13th through the 15th verse, Paul, he wrote that the judgment at the judgment seat of Christ, it won't be about salvation. Paul made mention of, and the reason why it won't be about salvation is because all of those who stand before the judgment seat of Christ will have already had salvation. That will be why we stand before the judgment seat of Christ It's because we have salvation and we cannot lose salvation. Paul said there. So when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, when we believers stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we should understand that that judgment will be about the giving of God's rewards. It will be about the giving of God's riches to all of those whose works have earned God's rewards and his riches. Now, after the judging of his own house, God will turn his attention to those who weren't in his house to all of those who are outside of his house, answering what Peter wrote in the 17th verse when he asked, hey, what is going to happen to all of those who aren't a part of that, that, that judging of the house of God? As shown again in the book of the Revelation of Christ in the 20th chapter of Revelation, in the 11th through the 15th verse, this will be a judgment that won't be pretty. There won't be anything pretty about the judgment of those outside of the house of God. The scripture, it shows us there that God will judge all of those who chose to reserve a place in the fire of eternal condemnation. And in his judgment, the sinner, they will be cast away from his presence for all of eternity. They will never be seen in the Lord's presence ever again. This is a judgment that you have heard me say repeatedly. Nobody should want to have any part in this judgment. 
Nobody should re be reserving a place in the eternal fire of condemnation. Why would you want to be there? Why would you want to be apart from the Lord? Why would you want to live everlasting life separate from the Lord? But again, I look at today's generation. Boy, oh boy. Sadly, today's generation, they are going and they are signing the board. They're writing their name, not in the kingdom of heaven, but in that eternal fire of condemnation. You see, when urgent warnings are given, for example, a severe thunderstorm, you know, we should take those warnings, we should take them seriously, shouldn't we? You know, if it's a tornado warning, hurricane, the hope is that those warnings would be heeded. But not everybody does it, do they? Now, some of us, we hard-headed, right? We stick out the hurricane. Some of us may be like me, you know, first clap of thunder. Instead of, <laughs> instead of trying to, to take protection, you know, I go, I run out the door to see where the storm coming from, to watch the clouds. And then I be sitting there telling my man, that thunder, man, it sound amazing, but that thunder sounds so good. <laughs> but I tell you today, we, we can't be that way. When it comes to the urgent warnings that Peter has given to us here today in the 7th and the 17th verse there, nobody should ignore the warnings that, that Peter has given that came from the warning that Jesus had given as well. And so again, if it's not clear to you, the urgent warning that we must heed today is that the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking to the end. The clock, it is ticking to God's judgment. This world, I want you to understand today, this world is going to end. It will not spin on forever. So I say to you today that there should be a sense of urgency. And I want to be clear about this. I didn't say that there should be a sense of a panic for you to run around frantic. I said a sense of urgency, prioritizing properly, knowing what should come first in your life. And what should be first in your life is for you to be preparing yourself to stand before the Lord. You should be getting yourself ready for his coming. Are you ready for his coming today? Now, some may begin to wonder, well, how do I get ready for his coming? How do I prepare myself for the arrival of the Lord? Well, again, if you're looking at the fourth chapter of 1 Peter there with me, in the eighth verse, Peter, he wrote that above all things, we should have fervent love for one another. Love, Peter said there in that same verse, love, he said, has the power to cover a multitude of sins. We know this very well because, again, Christ, he was given to us out of love. He gave his life for us out of love. And again, because we have believed in him, his love, it covers us from the punishment of sin, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll see there that Peter, he added on there in the ninth verse there that we should also be hospitable. In other words, that we should be cordial, that we should be respectful to, to one another. He said there, he added on there without grumbling. Mm -hmm. So we should be hospitable out of the sincerity of our heart. Mm -hmm. This is how we prepare ourselves for the coming of Christ. We prepare ourselves for the coming of Christ by the manner in which we live in this world. Mm -hmm. And so, again, looking at today's generation. Yeah, I'm still on today's generation. <laughs> Eight sermons in now. <clears throat> Where is the urgency? Where's the urgency for, for love? Where is the urgency of respect? 
Where is the urgency of, of care today? Where is the urgency of, of sharing and, and uplifting one another? There seems to be more of a, a priority when it comes to despising each other. There seems to be more of a priority today in finding a way to, to hate each other, to divide, to conquer, rather than to come together and, and to work together. Today's generation is one to tell people to leave and to go somewhere and somewhere else if someone doesn't look right, if someone don't dress right, if someone don't talk right, or, or if somebody don't believe the same things. We say to, to those that aren't the same, we say, hey, if you don't like it, then go somewhere else. What? Tough crowd. What, what is going on with today's generation? This is a notion that led Peter there in the 10th verse to call on us believers to minister the gifts we receive from God as good stewards of the manifold grace of, of the Lord. And so again, as believers, we should be spreading love throughout this world. I hope y'all ain't getting tired of me saying that over and over and over again every Sunday. But that's what we should be doing. That is our calling to fulfill. Yet love is seemingly absent in today's generation. That's why I have to keep preaching about it. Love has gone on vacation in today's generation. That's why I have to keep repeating it over and over and over and over again in my food for thoughts, in my Bible studies. We see it in the Sunday school lessons as well. That's why God has to keep telling us over and over and over again, love your neighbor. Because love is absent from us today. Again, there in my key verse, Peter, he called on believers. He called on us to, to be sober, to be sober minded, to, in other words, be serious, to be watchful in prayer. That's what he called on. That's what is needed today. To be sober minded again, it means that one is aware, that one is attentive, that one is serious, that, that one is intelligent. We must have a serious mindset about the clock ticking today. As we have seen, we should be living with a serious mind for, for being faithful and, and then growing in our faith. It is not enough for us to say that we are a child of God. It is not enough for us to say that we believe in the Lord. We must have faith. We must grow in our faith today. We must grow in our virtue. We must grow in our knowledge of the Lord while others choose to refuse to do so. And they become more immoral in their way. We must not be immoral in our way as the clock is ticking. I won't get no amens on that. We must continually consult the Lord, don't we? As I said last week, we must continually consult the Lord so that we are put in a position to win on this battlefield. So that we can win when we stand before the Lord. We, we cannot ignore God and think that we will stand before him and somehow win. You see, the serious believer is one that is, is prudent and considers their way. As it is said in the 22nd chapter of Proverbs and the third verse, the prudent, they foresee evil and they stay away from it. You stand away from evil today as the clock is ticking. However, the simple, as the proverb pointed out, the simple, they choose to continue into it. And they are punished because they choose to continue in evil, even though they have been warned after warning time and time again, he is on his way. So we should not be lazy in our faith today, should we? We shouldn't be lazy, nor should we take everything as if it is a laughing matter. You see, I, I look at the world today. 
I look at the ever-present wickedness that is growing and is present in our world today, and I don't look at it as if it is a joking or a laughing matter. It is something that, again, we must take seriously. Because, again, I want you to understand today that the devil, he is moving, and we must take this very seriously. It is, again, no laughing matter. The clock is ticking to the end. And now is not the time for us to be living with a mind that is of a fool. I won't get no amens there. Now, to fully understand the urgency that I am trying to preach with to all of you today, I want to take a look at a parable that Jesus shared with us, with the disciples, that I believe is very representative of the world in which we live in today. I believe that it also represents the kind of urgency that, that we must have as well today. So turn with me over to, again, the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. I know I just referenced it a few moments ago, so I hope that your fingers are still kind of stuck there. I want to take a look at the, the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, the first through the 13th verse there, where we will see Jesus' parable uh, the wise and foolish virgins. We'll see there in the opening verse of that chapter that Jesus, he stated, the kingdom of heaven, he said, shall be likened to 10 virgins going to meet the bridegroom. Now, right off the bat, I want to be very clear about this. Jesus, he was not saying that heaven, the place, is going to be filled with 10 virgins. Okay, I, I, I feel that I need to make that very clear. Okay. Now we'll see there in the second verse, as we continue to look at this parable here, we'll see that there was a sharp divide amongst the, the 10 virgins there, with half of them being considered wise, while the other half of them were considered foolish or considered simple. Now, why is that the case? Why was some considered wise while the other half was considered to be simple or to be fools? Well, we'll see there that the wise virgins, they had brought oil with them as they went out to, to go meet the bridegroom. The foolish virgins, we're told there, again, just taking a look at the third and the fourth verse there, we're told that the foolish virgins, they chose to do the opposite. They chose not to bring any extra oil because they presumed, they made a presumption, they again heard that the bridegroom was coming, and they presumed that meant that the groom would be there immediately, that, that the groom was coming right away. But again, like I said last week, presumptions, they'll get you into a whole bunch of trouble. Yeah. Now is not the time for you to be presuming anything. Now is not the time for you, the child of God, you, the believer, to be moving by presumptions. You must be moving by faith. Now, as the parable goes, we're told there that the groom's coming. We're told there that, guess what? It was delayed. Oh, boy. Oh boy, somebody in trouble now. We're told there in the fifth verse that the delay, that it was so long that all of the virgins, they slumbered and they slept. That's how long the wait was, a long wait. However, we'll see there in the sixth verse that at midnight there was a cry that was heard. The groom was on his way. The groom was coming. And we'll see there that all the virgins, that they arose, we're told there. They arose, they went out to go and meet the groom, trimming their lamps, we're told there. Ever again, we'll know that there was a problem. Somebody made an oopsie. Somebody made a boo-boo. There was a major problem for the half of the virgins that only had brought their lamps. They didn't bring any extra oil with them, and we'll see there that their lamps was going dim. Oh, boy. I promise you, all of this is representative of something that we see happening in the world today. 
But keep following along with me here. And so we'll see there in the eighth verse that the foolish virgins, they look to the wise ones and, and they ask them for some oil because, again, their lamps was, was dimming. They was losing light. And so the wise virgins, they looked at them and they frowned at them. You right, D, they shrugged their shoulders at them. <laughs> they looked at them like they was fools. And, and so we'll see there that they shook their heads and they told them, hey, you better go and run and you better go and get your own oil. I kind of made that like how we talk. That's how we tell them, you know, somebody come up to you and you, you know, you got something for yourself. You know, you don't want to be trying to go and run and get something else. You got yours. They didn't bring theirs. And they ask you for something. You're going to look at them like they crazy. You no, know, you better go and get something for yourself. Mm -hmm. That's what they did to them now. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody going to think that that was wrong of the wise virgins to do. But I promise you, they wasn't in the wrong. You know, there was something more <laughs> prescient. It was more pressure matters for them. They, they, they wanted to get to, to the groom. It, it wasn't time for them to be turning around to go back and, and to get some more because somebody chose not to do it. They didn't want to miss this coming, right? And so we'll see there in the 10th verse that the foolish virgins, they had to turn around. They had to go back to, to buy some more. But as it often happens in life, that was when the groom came. You know when you be waiting for somebody to, to call you, you be waiting all day long, but hey, you got to go use the bathroom or you got to go and take care of something somewhere else in your house and, and you didn't bring your phone with you and as soon as you stepped away and you come back, you look at your phone and that call you've been waiting on all day long, you see that you missed the call. Those foolish virgins, they done missed the call. And Jesus, he tells us there in this parable that the groom and those who were ready, he tells us that they, they went on into the wedding without the others. That was a wedding. This parable is about the coming of the groom and a wedding. Okay. And by the time the foolish virgins, by the time they returned, we'll see that the doors, they had been closed, shut, and they had been locked. There was no way that they could just Walk right in. And so we'll see there that they cried out there in the 11th and the 12th verse. They cried out, Lord, Lord. They was looking to be let in. But then the groom went to the door. And without opening the door, the groom said, Assuredly, I do not know you. I don't know you. That's what the groom said. I don't know you. This parable, like I said, it perfectly paints a picture of today's generation. For all of you that may be wondering, well, how does this parable, how does it paint a picture about us today? Well, let me break it down for you here. Today's generation, we have received a warning. In fact, we have received warning after warning that the end is at hand. We have received warning after warning that the bridegroom is coming. And again, I want you to understand today that the bridegroom represents Christ himself, the son of man. The virgins represent all of us. Some are wise, some are fools. Like I said, this parable, it represents us today. And so with this in mind, the groom's coming to the world, we would say that it has been delayed. It's been over 2,000 years, ain't it? And, and, and everybody know this, that it has been 2,000 years. Yeah, even though he's delayed, I tell you today that we should be Watchful. As the scripture says, we should be waiting and we should be prayerful for his arrival. We should all have our lamps lit. 
we should also have some oil so that our lamp remains lit and so that it does not go out. Now, Jesus, he pointed out there in that parable that all the virgins that they slumbered and that they slept during the delay. Now, you, you may begin to wonder, well, does this mean that everybody is slumbering and everybody is sleeping as Christ coming as has been delayed? My answer to that is absolutely not. You see, Jesus, he warned that in the 13th verse, he warned that we should watch therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So some of us, we have heeded that warning, right? Some of us, we are watchful. And again, like I said just a few minutes ago, some of us, we are waiting. Some of us, we are prayerful during this delay. As we again, we, we wait for his arrival. We wait for the bridegroom to come. However, many more are asleep today. Many more are asleep to Jesus' warning that he is coming. You see, there are many people today that don't believe in Christ, nonetheless believe in, in that he is going to come again. They know that it has been 2,000 years, and they mock. They say, hey, he hasn't come back yet. How many times do I make mention of that? We hear it all the time. That's why I make mention of it. Sadly, there are many today that profess to, to believe in Christ, but they don't believe he'll return in their lifetime. They think that they will die before he gets here. This is a mindset that is forgetful that even if he doesn't come before they pass away, they have to pass away. We have to leave this world. And guess what happens? Guess what happens next after we leave this world? You have to face the Lord. So this forgetful mind, it becomes a mind that procrastinates. It procrastinates in the, their profession of faith. Rather than moving by faith, the procrastinator has put off faith. The procrastinator has become slow in their faith. They have become like the foolish virgins that let their lamps burn out in their faith. Therefore, the procrastinator, they put themselves in a dangerous position because again, we know that the groom is coming and they will be caught without a flame of faith. Now is not the time for you to be letting your light go out. Now is not the time for you, the believer, to let your flame go out. That flame, I want you to understand today, that flame, it is representative of your faith. Is your faith on fire today? Now, again, is not the time for you to slumber and to sleep as sinners do. Do you hear me here today? As we have seen, when Jesus comes, the procrastinator, they will be caught trying to go and get some oil for their lamps. And, and it will be too late for them to be trying to go and get some oil to trim their lamps, to, to light that flame again. And so the, press, the procrastinator will end up missing the wedding with Christ. They will have to try again. Trying again through the great tribulation is going to be difficult. You do not want to miss the groom. You don't want to miss his coming. You don't want to miss the wedding. And see, this is a thought that reminds me of an old song that they used to sing down at Pilgrim Rest. They were singing the song that asked the question, what will you be doing when Jesus comes? What will you be doing when Jesus comes? Have you ever given that any kind of consideration in your heart and, and in your mind, what it is that you will be doing when he comes? 
I ask you today, will you be ready? Or will you be caught off guard doing something that you should not be doing? Will you be caught off guard without a flame? Will you be caught off guard without an, any oil for that lamp of yours? Will you miss the wedding? And Jesus, he again warned there that there will be a day when he utters the phrase, assuredly, I don't know who you are. I do not know you. I don't know about you, but for me, that's a phrase that I never want to hear the Lord say to me. I don't ever want to hear God say to me, I don't know you. I don't ever want God to not open his door up to me and to be yelling from behind the door, I don't know who you are. Get away from my house. That's what we do to those folks that always come up and ring your doorbell and knock on your, knock on your door. I, I don't want to hear that from, from the Lord. What about you? Do you understand the sense of urgency then? That, that you and I, that we should be living with today, and that all of those that are around us, the urgency, that they should be moving in as well. There should be a sense of urgency about the coming of Christ today. There should be a sense of urgency about the kingdom of God being at hand. There should be a sense of urgency about one having to stand before the Lord. We have to face his judgment. And there should be a sense of, of urgency about that. Now, this thought of urgency, it might confuse some of us because scripture and even myself, we are often encouraged to be patient, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would be remiss if I didn't add some clarity on here today about, again, being urgent. So I want to add some clarity on here today for those who may be confused about why all of the sudden urgency to be clear, there should be a sense of urgency for one to repent. That is, for one to turn away from whatever way that they are going in that is not the way of the Lord. There needs to be a sense of urgency from turning away from sin and turning to the Lord. You see, today's generation, it is in terrible need of, of repentance today. Because as I stand at the start of this series of eight sermons that I have preached here, today's generation is a generation that is adulterous in its heart. As it strays further and further away from God and into the pit of sin. It's straying further and further away to the fire of eternal condemnation. And what frightens me most about this is the lack of fear that so many people have about the fire of condemnation. They have no fear of hell. They have no fear of, of standing before the Lord. And that frightens me today because, again, God, he is coming. And he will cast those who choose to make that reservation in the pit of eternal fire. He will cast them away from his presence for, again, eternity. And so Peter, he asked there in the 18th verse, he asked, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, he asked, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? You see, we take, we take for granted the difficulty for one to have salvation. We take for granted the difficulty for, for one to be saved. Don't forget today that Christ, he prayed about the bitter cup that he had to suffer. He prayed about the bitter cup that he had to drink in order for us to have salvation. In order for us to be saved, Christ, he prayed. He prayed and he prayed about the cross. And he said, hey, if it is in your will, then I will get on that cross. And I thank God today that he did die for me and for you. 
And see, Christ, he met the suffering of the cross. He met it head on. What will you do? Yeah, like I said last week, victory now is contingent on what we do. Are you making yourself ready for victory? Every good coach will tell you that in order for you to win, you must prepare. You can't enter into a game without preparation and think that you will win the game. The team that does that, they often lose. You can't get by on talent. Again, if you desire to enter into heaven, I want you to understand today that you're not born just to walk into heaven. We are born into a world of sin. And so we must repent. We live in a world of sin. Sin is in our nature. Nobody is perfect. And so again, we must have a, a sense of urgency of turning our life around. We must have a sense of urgency from, from, from turning away from sin and turning to God. How many of us will turn to the Lord today? Now, the sense of urgency to repent, it goes away when you confess faith, true faith, when you confess it in your heart. However, there is still a sense of urgency that remains. And the sense of urgency that remains for all of us who are of sincere faith, is for us to remain faithful, to keep the faith. The devil will try you in this world today. The devil and all of those who are in his army, they will try to get you to turn away from, from your faith, to turn away from God. As Job was tested, you will be tested. And so, again, there is a sense of urgency for you today, for you to remain faithful, for you to keep the faith, for you to keep trusting in the Lord, and for you not to lean on your own understanding or on the understanding of a fool. Because a fool is going to lead you into destruction. But God will lead you into everlasting life. This is why Peter said there in the 15th verse, this is why he called on believers not to suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as evildoers or get this as busy bodies and other people's matters. You shouldn't be in other folks matters. You see, Peter was saying that the sincere believer shouldn't be caught up and stirring up a whole bunch of mess. See, there are more prescient matters at hand for the soul today. And that's why he calls on us to, again, minister the gospel, to minister the good news to the best of our ability. We are to live for the Lord by living for each other. And again, there needs to be a sense of urgency in doing that today. You see, when Jesus comes, we should be caught serving the Lord. When Jesus comes, we should be caught doing good. We should be caught caring and, and uplifting one another. We should be caught helping to save souls because we have the ability given to us by the Lord to do just that, leading souls to Christ. We shouldn't be doing the opposite. We should not be crushing souls today. So I want to close today's message out on what Peter what he said there in the 19th verse. Well, Peter, he said that today is a time to be of faith and to be committed to faith. Peter, he called on us believers to commit our souls to the Lord in doing good as to a faithful creator. God, he is faithful to us. And here we should be faithful to him as the clock is ticking. As the clock is ticking to the end, as it is click, as it is ticking to his judgment, you and I today, we should be faithful. We should be faithful with fervent love, helping to uplift all of those that are around us. Again, I say, let us be of faith today as the clock ticks. Amen. 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 
Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's message and I hope that you'll share it with someone somewhere. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you like this video, follow the channel as well as hit the alert bell so that you don't miss any notifications, so that you don't miss any of the wonderful videos that we share here on the Newfound Faith YouTube channel.